I want to show you something in just a moment. I want to show you a little video. And the reason I'm showing you these, these scenes, these sights, is because I want you to get faith for what is possible. This stadium that we're in today, this is not the end. This is not the finish line. This is the beginning of a Jesus revolution that will sweep America. It will sweep South America. It will go to the ends of the earth in Jesus' name. Do you want to see? Come on, let's go to Africa. Jesus is the answer for this nation. Jesus is the answer for Nigeria. Jesus is the answer for Africa. Say amen. Everyone who called upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. America come on ask him say Lord do it in America do it in my nation wherever you're from do it in Brazil do it in Argentina do it all over the world in Jesus name in Jesus name I want to take a couple of minutes and open the Word of God is that okay how many of you believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation I'm an evangelist and that means that wherever I go, I preach the gospel. When we were talking about doing this meeting, I had one request. Whatever happens, we have to preach the gospel. Because the gospel is the power of God and I will never be ashamed of it in Jesus' name. Say amen. amen. I'm not going to talk to you for a long time. I only have a few minutes. But I want to read to you a portion of scripture from the book of Luke. And it begins in chapter 9. And this little section from verse 57 to 62, it has a little subheading that says something very interesting. I want you to listen. It says, the cost of following Jesus. Everybody say that. The cost of following Jesus. Say it again. The cost of following Jesus. How many of you knew there was a cost to follow Jesus? How many of you knew that when you say yes to Jesus, that's not the end of your journey, that's just the beginning. Today is going to be an amazing day. I wish that you knew all the things that were in store for you. I will reiterate what, what Andy and others have said. You definitely do not want to leave. At the end of the night tonight, there's going to be a mass outpouring of signs, wonders, and miracles. And then we are going to bring up men and women of God, fathers and mothers of the faith that are gonna release a mantle of evangelism over this stadium. And the Holy Spirit is going to fall here. People are going to go through the crowd laying their hands on you. Many of you are going to have defining moment encounters in your life today. But before we get to that, there's something that we have to take care of first. Because the fire always and only falls on a sacrifice. In the Old Testament, the sacrifice was an animal. But in the New Covenant, the sacrifice was Jesus and then he said now you take up your cross and follow me that means that now the sacrifice has got to be you and if you want the fire to fall you've got to be on the altar so in Luke chapter 9 let me read verse 59 and it came to pass in verse 57 that as they went along the way a certain man said unto him Lord I will follow you wherever you go Jesus said unto him Foxes have holes, of, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Today I want to tell you about three things very quickly that you need if you want to be a follower of Jesus. 
You might read this passage and you might say to yourself, I'm not so sure why Jesus responded to that young man the way that he responded. I want you to notice what he said. He said, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. That was actually quite a good statement to make, wouldn't you say? And yet Jesus doesn't say, well, fine, then anything you want is yours. He said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And you might wonder why, but you have to understand that in those days, it was very common for rabbis to have students that would follow them and learn from them. And in those days, if you were a young student who was looking for a rabbi, the rabbi was supp supposed to take care of you. He was responsible to feed you and to give you a place to live. All of your needs would be met by that rabbi who was your teacher. So when this young man came to Jesus and he said, Lord, I'll follow you anywhere you go, what he was saying essentially was this, Lord, I'm willing to do all of this for you. Now what are you gonna do for me? He was trying to enter into a negotiation with Jesus. And here is the first principle, if you want to follow Jesus, there can be no negotiation. Everybody say no negotiation. Jesus is not going to barter with you. He's not going to argue with you. He's not going to make you a bunch of promises to sweeten the deal. Sometimes I hear preachers preaching the gospel and, and they, they, they present it like some sort of a, a sales pitch. If you follow Jesus, he'll make you happy, healthy, wealthy, and wise. But that's not the way Jesus presented it. He said, if you want to follow me, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. In fact, in my altar calls, I wish I could put up a barbed wire fence and say, if you want to follow Jesus, I dare you to come down here. Because he's worth it. He's worth the price of our very lives. Then there's another man. In verse 59, Jesus said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, allow me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but you go and preach the kingdom. You know, I have to be honest with you. I grew up in the church. I've heard these stories my whole life. And this is one of the stories that always challenged me. Because I thought to myself, you know, I feel like that young man made a pretty reasonable request. I want you to imagine that your father had just died and the funeral is going to take place later on that day and Jesus came along on a whirlwind tour through the country and he tapped you on the shoulder and he said follow me I think many of us would have the same response we'd say Lord yes I will follow you notice he didn't say no he said yes he just had one request he said but first allow me to go and bury my father and I was praying and I said Lord I don't understand why were you so unreasonable with this young man? Why were you so impatient with him? How many of you would also have had the same request? Let me first go bury my father. Come on, if you don't want to go to your father's funeral, you've got other problems we can talk about later. I said, Lord, I don't understand. And then the Lord spoke to me. And this is what he said to me. Are you listening? Are you listening? He said, what makes you think that his father was dead? Suddenly I realized something. I suddenly understood what was happening. You see, the Bible doesn't say that the father had died. It just said that the young man wanted to wait until a more convenient time to respond to the call of God in his life. You see, the problem wasn't that he loved his father so much. The problem was those two small, seemingly insignificant words, but first. My friend, let me tell you something. Those two words have robbed so many people of their destiny. They've robbed so many people of their calling. They've robbed so many people of the will of God in their lives because they thought there would be a more convenient time to say yes to Jesus than at the moment that he called them. To some of us, he comes like he's going to come to many of you today and he says, follow me. And we say, yes, Lord, but first, maybe you're very young. You say, Lord, let me grow up. Let me graduate from high school and then I'll follow you. So we grow up, we, we graduate high school, we go off to college. The Lord says, follow me. We say, yes, Lord, I want to follow you. But first, let me graduate from college and get a job, save up a little bit of money, and then I'll follow you. So we graduate from college. We, we get a job. We get married. We have a, a house, a white picket fence, and a dog, the American dream. And the Lord comes us, to us again, and he says, follow me. And we say, yes, Lord, I will follow you. But first, let me put my kids through school. 
But first, let me collect my pension for my retirement. And every time the Lord comes, there's a reason why we can't say yes today. And before we know it, they're burying us six feet under the ground. And there we lie, having never fulfilled the will of God in our lives because of those two little words, but first. Can I tell you something, my friend? There are people in hell today, not because they said no to Jesus, but because the devil convinced them that they could say yes tomorrow. The devil doesn't mind if you say yes to Jesus as long as you don't say it today. How many of you know the scripture that says today is the day of salvation? If you know that one, raise your hands. Okay, that was a trick question. There's actually no such scripture in the Bible. Look it up. It doesn't say today is the day of salvation. It says now is the day of salvation. Now, now, now. Do you know why it says that? If a man is drowning in the river, he doesn't need to be saved sometime today. He needs to be saved right now. My friend, if you're going to say yes to Jesus, not only can there be no negotiation, but there can be no procrastination. Now is your day. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Then there was one more thing. Verse 61, another said also, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me go and say goodbye to those that are at my house. And Jesus said to him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Number one, there can be no negotiation. Number two, there can be no procrastination. But number three, there can be no hesitation. My friend, listen to me. Many of you are being called by Jesus even right now as I speak. And I think about these men that Jesus called, especially that one in the middle that said, but first, if only he had understood what was happening. If only he knew who it was that was calling his name. Jesus was not just another teacher. He was not just another rabbi. He was the king of kings. He was the Lord of lords. My friend, when Jesus calls your name, there is no greater privilege in all of heaven or all of earth. Say amen. amen. I heard very clearly as I was driving here this morning, the Lord said, the word prodigal and I believe that here in this arena this afternoon or this morning whatever it is there are many prodigal sons and prodigal daughters you're away from the Lord you know the story of the prodigal son so moves my heart because I think of that young man in the in the pit with the pigs eating their food trying to satisfy his soul with the most vile and disgusting food how many of you know when you're hungry You'll fill your soul with anything you can get your hands on. And there he was in that pigsty. And the Bible says that he came to himself and he realized, even my father's servants at home, they eat better than I eat. But he was worried because he said, what if I go home and my father rejects me? What if he casts me out? What if he's angry with me? And so he stayed in that pig pen far too long. And then finally, when it got too bad, he couldn't stay there any longer. He slowly went home. I imagine he was dragging his heavy feet behind him every step of the way. And when he came over the horizon, the father was sitting there in a rocking chair on the front porch looking, and there he saw the silhouette of his son coming over the hillside. And the Bible says that the father got up and ran to him. And I want you to notice what happened when the father found him. He threw his arms around him. He kissed him. He gave him a new robe. He put rings on his fingers. He gave him shoes for his feet. He threw a feast and killed the fatted calf. And here's the thing I want you to listen back to. That young man, all those days he had spent in that pigsty worrying about what his father would do. He had nothing to fear. The father just wanted him to come home. That's all he wanted. He didn't even ask what the young man had been doing. Didn't even ask him how he had spent all of that money, he just welcomed him home. If you're a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter, you need to understand something. God is not waiting for you standing behind the door with a baseball bat ready to hit you when you come back in the door. His arms of love are wide open. In fact, when Jesus died on the cross, he died with his arms nailed open. It was an eternal picture, an eternal emblem to you that the arms of God are open. He welcomes you home. Come back in Jesus' name. I'm not going to preach anymore, but this is the moment of salvation right now for so many of you. And if you only knew, 
If you only knew what God had in store for you, musicians, you can come back. If you only knew the destiny that God had for you. I remember when I was a teenager, I was, I was mightily touched by God in a, in a revival that happened close to where I lived. And I fell in love with Jesus. I was even filled with the Holy Spirit. And me and my friend who's going to come here and talk to you in a moment, we used to meet every morning and we would pray for an hour before school. And then at lunchtime, we'd pray for another hour. And then after school, we'd get together and pray for another couple of hours. And I remember one day, we were in a prayer meeting early in the morning. And I just had this sense, and I think some of you will know what I'm talking about, that although I loved the Lord, and although I, I wanted Him in my life, I was still being drawn by what the world had to offer. I was 16 years old. And for a 16-year-old, there's so many things that call to you from so many different angles. And I, I sensed that I was in the worst situation possible because I had enough of God in my life that I wasn't enjoying the world. But I had enough of the world in my life that I wasn't fully enjoying God. And I went and grabbed my friend and I pulled him aside and I said, Russ, I said, we have to make a decision today. I can't live this way anymore. He said, right now, right here today, we are going to make a decision. Either we are going to go into the world, we're going to live it up, we're going to enjoy everything that it has to offer, and we're going to enjoy our youth while we are young, or we're going to turn our backs on everything. We're going to turn our faces toward the kingdom of God. And from this moment forward, we will never look back. And that day with our hands held and tears streaming down our faces, we made a commitment to live for the kingdom of God. My friend, I didn't know back then that I would see millions of people come to the Lord. I didn't know that I'd see people raised from the dead. I didn't know that I'd see mighty miracles, cripples getting out of wheelchairs and blind eyes opening. I didn't know that I'd be here today talking to you. All I knew is that Jesus called me. And I said, yes. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you a question. And I want everyone to stand to your feet. This is a holy moment right now. If you can stand, please stand. This is a holy moment. For some of you here, this is the holiest moment of your life. If you know that you need to surrender your life to Jesus today, you need to say yes to him once and for all. I'm not talking about just answering an altar call. I'm talking about making a decision, drawing a line in the sand. From this day forward, you're saying, from now on, I say yes. No more but firsts. No more hesitation. No more negotiation. No more procrastination. Today, I say yes to Jesus. And listen, this is for those of you. I know that almost everyone would raise your hands if I left it like that. But I'm going to make this very very specific if you are away from God maybe you've never been saved maybe you're a prodigal maybe you are in that position like I was that you're straddling that fence you're halting between two opinions and today you're ready to get off the fence and you're ready to throw everything in I want you to lift your hand so I can pray with you wherever you are all over this place thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus Come on, this is what we're going to do right now. I'm going to lead you in a prayer for salvation. There's nothing magical about these prayers. It's not the words that save you. All I'm doing is putting my arm around you and trying to help you to articulate the cry of your own heart. But listen to me. This has got to come from you. Jesus doesn't speak Spanish. He doesn't speak English. He doesn't speak Portuguese. He speaks heart. That's what he wants to hear. He wants to hear your heart. So I want everyone to lift their hands. We're all going to pray this together in support of those that are praying it for the first time. Do not whisper. I want you to lift your voice. Are you ready? Yes. Say, Dear Lord, Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you today, to you today. A, sinner a sinner needing salvation. Needing salvation. Lord, Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, as of this day, I say yes. I say yes. I say yes. To you, Lord Jesus. No more hesitation. No more procrastination. No more negotiation. As of this day, I belong to Jesus. And Jesus belongs to me. I believe it. I receive it. I confess it in the name of Jesus. 
And everybody say, amen. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. Hallelujah. If you made that decision today, we want to congratulate you and welcome you into the family of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen, we want you at this time to text the word SAVED to 97123. If you made that decision today, we have some materials we want to get to you. We have a book by evangelist Reinhard Bonnke called Now That You Are Saved. And today we want to hand those to you. In order to get one, just take out your smartphone right now, please. If you made that decision and text the word SAVED, S-A-V-E-D, to 97123. And I want you to fill out a few questions on that text message. And then after that, raise your hand. And we want to put a book in your hand right now. Ushers all over the stadium are coming. And if you made a decision for Jesus, we want to put this book in your hand. Also, Evangelist Daniel Kalenda has a video series on Now That You're Saved. We want to send that to you to encourage your next steps in your life in Christ. Also, we want to help you find a good gospel preaching, Bible-believing church. So if you could at this time take out your smartphones and text the word SAVED to 97123. After you do that, fill out the few questions, and we want you to, at that time, lift your smartphone in the air, and ushers are coming right now to identify you and make sure that you get the Now That You're Saved book. We want to put this in your hand. We want to bless you. We want to pray with you. We want to help plug you into a local church. We want to encourage you on your journey in your new life in Jesus Christ. Amen? If that's you and you made a decision, just go ahead and text us right now. And as soon as you're done with that, lift up your hands and the ushers are going to identify you now and put a Now That You're Saved book in your hand. We love you, congratulations, and the best is yet to come in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Guys, I need you to lift up a huge shout to Jesus right now. No, no, a bigger shout to Jesus, please. Come on, louder, louder. Let our is outrageous he's amazing you know God took me just the way I was a drug addict 22 years an atheist angry bitter hurt people people are dead because of the life that I lived and God loved me when I was twisted and I had no idea and not one Christian told me about Jesus nobody came up to me for 34 years of my life and said Jesus loved me. People told me why I might go to hell, why this, if this doesn't change, and this doesn't change, you have no power to change yourself. And I hear people preach, God will take you just the way you are. And that's true, he does, he takes you just the way you are. But the gospel demands change. God will take you just the way you are. But grace enables you to walk out what truth calls you to. And grace is not a license to sin or a license to do whatever you want. Grace is the ability to walk like Jesus says we can walk. 
Grace is the ability to live like Jesus says we can live. Jesus said when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide us into all truth. And when I got saved, I didn't just get a little saved, I got completely saved. See, I went from a place of freezing cold to burning hot in a moment. In a moment, freezing cold to burning hot. A living flame, and it's just getting worse. And when I say worse, I mean better. And people told me, you need to cool down because this is a marathon, it's not a sprint, but that's not even in the message version. This is a race, and without grace, you can't run right. Grace is beautiful. Grace meets me in my bedroom when I open my Bible and say, God, I'm not seeing this in my life, and I need you to make me become what this word says. Grace says to live a life worthy of the call. What does it mean to walk worthy of the call? I mean, what kind of price did heaven pay for you? Your worth is determined by the price that was paid for you. And if heaven went bankrupt to get you back, that makes you pretty important to the Father. And when you find out your value and you find out your worth and you find out your identity, you want to silence the devil's accusations for life. And when he speaks to you, he's not speaking to you from inside of you once you got born again. He's speaking to you from outside trying to reclaim your identity. To go out and pray for people means that you have to live in a place of you've been accepted by the Father. I'm accepted in the beloved. There's not a man, a woman, a child that can take away what they never gave me. The Bible says in Ephesians that I am accepted in the beloved. God doesn't want you to be hot or cold. Or he doesn't want you to be warm. He wants you to be burning. I'm going to read a section of scripture. A lot of Christians read this and they're like, Jesus is knocking on your door if you just let him in. That scripture is out of context because he's not reading that to people that are not saved. He's reading that to people that have locked him out. See, this is a big deal. This life is a dressing room for eternity. What you do now. What you do now with your life and where you're going to do now, what, who are you going to talk to, how are you going to talk, how are you going to act, how are you going to function. We've got this, I heard Francis Chan preach this message, I, I was talking to him the other day, I, I watched this about this little rope that had this little tiny thing at the end of it, but it was like the eternal life ahead of it. And it was just this little window and you've got a little window of opportunity right now. Are you going to fully submit? Are you going to fully surrender? Or are you just going to stay incorporate Jesus? This is not incorporate Jesus. This is fully surrender, fully burn, fully in love with him everywhere you go. What does it mean to be on fire for him? I heard another amazing man by the name of Bill Johnson. You might have heard of him. Amazing father of the faith. <laughs> whom We all love. He said, being on fire is like someone putting a, a quart of gasoline on you and then lighting a match. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, if someone lit a match and I'm burning, I don't care what anybody thinks. I am burning. Ah, I'm burning! If you're really on fire, it's not going to matter what anybody thinks about you, what anybody says about you. But at the same time, we can't afford to live a life of compromise and call it grace. Grace is not compromise. People are like, well, I don't, I don't like this message. I don't care what you like. God gave us the Holy Spirit because he's holy. And the Holy Spirit doesn't share occupancy. Look, we need to be so secure in our identity and who God has called us to be that there is a no vacancy sign on your forehead. No room at the end. I love the miraculous. I get to see people healed every day. Every day. Watch. We were going to wait till later, but I'm just going to do it real quick, okay? If you've got some kind of sickness or disease in your body, put your hand up. Okay. Now, everybody put your hand on somebody beside you. Now, listen. It's only going to be a, a real quick, but later it's going to break out like nuts. <laughs> I just want you to do this. On the count of three... We're just going to yell Jesus, and then God's going to heal people. Because it's the name. 
It's that name. It's the name. On the count of three, we're going to yell Jesus. And many, many thousands of people will be healed in a moment. Are you ready? On the count of three, we're going to yell Jesus. One. Two. Three. Jesus! Okay. That's a pretty bold proclamation to make, unless the name is real. Now, I want you to check your body physically real quick. Whatever you were dealing with, you can check physically. If it's gone, wave both hands over your head. Come on, if it's gone, wave both hands over your head. This isn't technical. It's the name. 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 As Christians, we can't afford to sacrifice truth on some altar of trying to be culturally relevant. As Christians, you're a Christ-like one, a little Christ-like one. That's what it means, a little anointed one with the ability to anoint. We cannot afford to sacrifice truth on some altar of being culturally relevant. We can't afford as Christians to say, abortion's okay. The only way that you can think that abortion is okay is if you're still an orphan and don't know that you're a son. The only way that you can think that killing a baby would be okay is if you really don't know the father. The only way that you can say that children have the right to change their gender is you're believing in the wrong God. The only way that you can be okay with same-sex marriage is you don't know the Father. Guys, look, I look out in the crowd and some of you are upset by that. Get over yourself and believe the gospel. Get over yourself and believe the gospel. God doesn't hate people. I encounter people that are in the wrong relationships all the time. I'm not condemning them. They need to know who their father is because all of it is fixed with the loving embrace of our Heavenly Father, of our Abba, of our Abba Dad. Abba, Abba, Abba. Pornography must be cut out of our life. Pornography is not okay. The youngest full-time prostitute that I know that has been rescued is a three-year-old little girl. And you're gonna sit here and tell me that it's okay for pornography to be okay. It's not okay. Fantasy must be shut down. Fantasy isn't shut down by rebuking a fantasy. Fantasy is shut down by bringing every thought captive using the weapons that we've been given. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for bringing every thought captive. When a thought runs across you, when something invading runs across your screen, you need to know the truth and the truth will set you free. This is normal Christianity. This is the burning bush. God says, take it off. Put off the old Jew and put on Christ. Put on Christ. I believe that the church is waking up. I believe that a sleeping giant is arising. I believe that a bold and fearless generation is coming forth that has no time for lies. I believe in the reality of the kingdom, not just then, but now. 
Guys, we have everything. According to life and godliness, we've been, we've been given everything. It's all ours. What are you going to do with it? I know so many people that are pressing in to all these different things, but don't even read their Bible anymore. They'd rather watch CNN to see what's going on. Rather than reading the good news, it's only good news. It's only good news in there. I get on a plane and she goes, would you like a paper? I say, no, I have the good news. It's always good news. It's always good news. It's all good. Sir, settle down. I can't. And I'm locked in a steel tube at 35,000 feet with people that need the Lord. Guys, it's time we rise up. It's time we believe the gospel. It's time we become an uncompromising breed. One that the world has never seen. Ask people why they don't join the church and they'll tell you because it's full of hypocrites. We do not have to be hypocrites. We need to get off of Facebook and get on our face. We need to have a personal relationship, not just talk about having one. We need to have an intimacy with the Father where it's a, it's a co-laboring thing where I can talk to Him and He talks to me. He likes to talk. He's the Word of God. Guys, what an opportunity. Your light shining, you burning and blazing and not compromising your faith for the sake of sleeping with your girlfriend. Like, well, I don't want to talk about this. I don't care if you want to. It's an epidemic. Sexual immorality is an epidemic in the church. We need to crush that thing. We need to pick up a stone and drop that giant. What are you so afraid of? God sees it all. He sees it. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. Oh, I wasn't going to go here, but I'm going to. Oh. Listen to this. Verse 7, it says, we walk by faith and not by sight. Instead, I say that we are confident and willing to be absent from the body. We would like to be present with the Lord. So leaving here, being present with Him. Listen, this is right before your new creation scripture that we all love so much. And I am so thankful that I'm a brand new creation, that old things have passed away and that all things have become new. All things. That means the old man that liked pornography, the old man that liked sexual immorality, the old man that liked drugs, the old man that liked drinking is dead. It says, for we must all, listen to this, for we must all, oh, I missed a verse, sorry. So whether we are present or absent, we labor that we may be accepted by him. Listen to this. Whether we're with him or not with him. What does it mean? You're with him, you'll be pleasing. But the, the scripture doesn't say that when we're just with him, it says to be absent. See, what you do now determines eternity. Now, he's already sealed eternity. When you say yes to Jesus, you're saved, justified by faith, having peace with God. But it's not just a one-time moment of saying yes. It's a lifetime of yes to the word. Whether present or absent, we labor that we may accept it by him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive his recompense in the body, whether he has done good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are revealed to God, and I trust that we're also revealed to your conscience. We're not commending ourselves again, but instead give you occasion to boast on our behalf, that you may have something to answer to those who boast in appearance and not in heart. If we're beside ourselves, it's for God. If we're in our right mind, it's for you. Love of Christ constrains us or compels us or dominates us because we judge this that if one died, all die. He died for all that those that live should no longer live for themselves but for he who died for them and rose again. You are going to stand before Jesus and you're going to answer for your life. 
And I would much rather you answer for your life now than stand before him and fear all day, every day. Because some people call it love to sleep with your girlfriend. It's not love, it's lust. Make a covenant. Make a covenant. Make a covenant. There are people all throughout this place that are struggling with pornography. I know it. I talk to people all the time. And I am not mad at you. But I'm telling you right now that Jesus, Jesus sees the theater room of your soul. He sits in the theater room and he watches everything that goes across your screen. He knows that nothing's hidden from him. We need to repent and come out from that thing right now. Right now. Boyfriends, girlfriends, sexual immorality, same sex stuff. All of it. All that junk, drug addiction, alcohol, all of it needs to be crushed right now, right here. So if that's in your life and you want it gone, I believe right now is a Kairos moment that that would be crushed. If that is in you, I need you, only those right now, to raise your hands. Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, I want everybody around them to put their hands on them right now. We have 52 seconds right now. In the name of Jesus, loose them right now in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you. The flame of heaven come right now. Holy Ghost, crush this thing in Jesus' name right now. More. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come right now. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke. He snaps, snaps the yoke. In Jesus' name, more, more, more. Mas fogo, mas fogo. Spirito Santo. Spirito Santo, fuego, fuego, fuego. Fire of God comes. In Jesus' name, let it be done. We're believing today is going to be a catalytic day where the Lord's going to thrust forth missionaries into the mission field. I'm here with Pastor Abe Huber, and the Huber family were missionaries that were thrust forth from America into Brazil. And Pastor Abe is a seed that the Lord planted in the nation of Brazil, South America. Amazon region and from there they bear fruit today. They're leading a lot of fruitful things church planning apostolic networks and I just want him as a living testimony of this to share and commission Nations that are represented here that have received missionaries to be now the missionaries Amen. Thank you tell God is so good. He is raising up a new generation of young people from all around the world that are going to reach the nations for Jesus. We have seen in Brazil is one example of many what's happening. A great revival is happening. But we realize that we are the result of years and years of missionaries from America and from Europe that gave their lives, that gave their lives like my parents did. My, both of my parents died in the Amazon, giving their lives for Jesus, giving their lives for Jesus. And that seed has sprouted up and now is raising up a revival of young people to take this legacy, this heritage to the nations. You know, God has been so good. We've seen, literally, connected to our ministry by God's infinite grace, thousands of churches that are spreading across Brazil, hundreds of thousands 
of people being touched in Brazil and in the nations. And I want to say something to you. I want to say something to you that are passionate for Jesus. You that love Jesus in Brazil and all over the world. If you're a, a young person or at least have a young heart and you love Jesus, I declare over you Romans 16, 20. But the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, under your feet. The nations will become the glory of God, will be full of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Let's agree together in prayer, in prayer and faith now. Let's take possession of the nations for Jesus. Father, we agree now. We pray together that this great heritage, the legacy of missionaries that gave their life for your kingdom, that this legacy will continue, Father, that it will spread across the nations, that it will conquer every tribe, every tongue, people group. We already see them bowing. We take possession of your promise that in the last days, your spirit will be poured over all flesh. And every tongue, every tongue will confess. Every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord.
and French, wherever you speak, and just say, there is no one like you. Não há outro como tu, Jesus. Tu és santo, Senhor. You are holy. Just fill this with worship. Take it up a notch. Jesus, holy, holy, holy. 
Aplauda Jesus onde você estiver. Tu és o Rei Jesus, o desejado das nações. You're the desire of the nations, Jesus. You're the desire of the nations. Eu não tenho pra onde voltar Só tenho você, Deus Palavra de vida eterna Pra onde eu irei Se eu não tenho pra onde voltar Só tenho você, só você Palavra de vida eterna Pra onde eu irei
coming in here. As we're just singing Portuguese, lift your hands all across the place. We join with the multi-ethnic glorious church, singing his glory. Just begin to worship him. He's coming in. Every tribe and every tongue worshiping. Feel the glory coming. We welcome your glory. We're going to pray the fire of God that's hit Latin America over the past decades that hit Brazil, Argentina, Colombia. We're going to pray this fire coming to America right now. I want to unite us, unite with somebody next to you, independent of what language you speak. We're going to pray the fire of Latino America and America del Norte. That's what we're going to go for right now. Pai, in the name of Jesus. Nós declaramos o um fogo organizado. América e Brasil! América e Brasil! América Latina e Brasil! Fogo organizado! Fogo nas nações! Avivamento nas nações! Glória de Deus nas nações! O fogo! O fogo! O fogo do Espírito! Father God, we pray for your fire coming in this place! Release your glory all over! We pray for fresh impartation! Over the U.S., we bless the nation, we bless the nation, fire of God, fire. Pai, nós oramos pelo avivamento real e poderoso partido da América do Sul, da América Latina para o mundo. Nós oramos por jovens incendiados que irão tocar povos e nações, que a geração se levante agora, agora.
What's unusual about this event is the celebration of the nations. I mean, the Brazilians, Latinos, African Americans, we don't want to wash away the color barrier. We love the color. Okay. We love the nations. And I just want to do something very quickly from the bottom of my heart. You know, as we Americans go to the nations, I have often heard leaders say, you Americans come in with an attitude that you think you're going to save the whole world without us. And I just want to say to you, we need you. We cannot evangelize the world without the whole world working together. And anyway, we've been paternalistic. Our, you know, even towards the Latinos or the Brazilians, you know, we have not acknowledged your great moves of God. I want to say to you, it's going to take the whole church to evangelize the whole world. And we love you. And we love each other. Amen. Amen. Is it true? Amen. Amen. Whoa. What an incredible moment. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to have a little bit of a prayer rumble right now to get ready for everything God is about to pour out this afternoon. We're believing that God is going to give specific instructions to every person here. Some of us are going to be hearing about high schools. Some of us are going to be hearing about college campuses. Some of us are going to be hearing about neighborhoods and nations. There is going to be an outbreak of the voice of God giving instructions. Repentance can be joyful. Repentance doesn't need to always be heavy. If we live day to day, repentance can be the most joyful, fun thing. How many of us would love to repent of any passivity in our lives and say, God, now is the hour to take action. Now is the hour for my calling to erupt. Wave your hand if you're tired of being silent. You're tired of putting off for another day what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do right now. How many of you have had instructions from the Holy Spirit, and you thought, well, maybe, but right now is that maybe is gone, it's now. I do this thing, I believe in the four R's. I repent, I receive forgiveness, I rebuke the enemy, I believe there is a real enemy that needs to be rebuked, and I replace it with an opposite spirit. Instead of passivity, I take action. Would you get ready to rumble right now? We're going to get with a couple of people right around you. You'll get with a little group. And the first 
15 second rumble is God, we're done with apathy, inaction, passivity. It's time, it's time to take action. Would you pray right now with somebody next to you and say, I repent of inaction. I repent of passivity. Hurry up right where you are, right where you are. Let it erupt in this stadium. I'm done with apathy. Keep praying right where you are. I repent, I turn the other way. I'm ready to hear your voice. I'm ready to hear your voice. Speak to me, Holy Spirit. Pray with me out loud, in Jesus' name. Pray with me out loud, in Jesus' name. Passivity, I run from you. I'm done with you, and I am forgiven, and I take authority. I won't be paralyzed anymore. It's time to take action in the Holy Spirit. The second thing we want to clear off our whiteboards is fear. How many of us have had enough of fear in our lives? The fear today. We are declaring war on the fear of man, the fear of being known, the fear of someone finding out what's really going on in our lives. How many of you, raise your hand, are ready to repent with all of your heart and say, I am sick and tired of fear. It's time for courage. It's time for courage. Pray with me right now. Dear Jesus, I repent, I repent of the fear of man. Fear of man. I, will I will not be silent. As of right now, of right now. I'm, back. I'm, back. I'm back. I'm back. I rebuke fear. I rebuke fear. Be, gone be gone from this place. Out of my life. Of my life. It's time for, courage. time for courage. And let's talk about courage for a minute. How many of us are going to have to say yes to the cost of starting something brand new? Some of us are going to have to say yes to the cost of being misunderstood. How many misunderstood ones are in this stadium today that have to keep saying yes to being misunderstood so God can do a new thing in this nation and save it? Some of us have to say yes to the loneliness that comes from pioneering with Jesus Christ. Some of us have to say yes to getting rid of our comforts, our materialism, and saying, God, make me uncomfortable again. Would you pray that out? Jesus, make me uncomfortable again. Pray that right where you're at. Let's go 15 seconds. God, I wanna be uncomfortable. Holy Spirit, come down in this stadium. In Jesus' name. How many of you have a friend who likes to have all the details before they obey God? They want to know how it's going to work out before they step out. How many of us know that God leaves out a lot of the plan? He takes you through it step by step. Are you ready to take God's plan step by step? Because somebody here is going to Pakistan, and somebody here is going to China, and somebody here is going to college campuses, and someone's going to the Middle East, and someone's going to Europe, someone's going to France, a bunch of you are going to Germany, some of you are going to walk into England and see a great awakening. Are you ready for your to-do orders from Jesus Christ? The third thing, we got to clear our whiteboard. It's the heaviest thing. Turn to someone and say, this is heavy. It's heavy because we've got to make a big decision. The Bible says in Ephesians, not only do you and I need to be tender, not only tender-hearted, kind, but we've got to forgive everyone. Would you say it out loud? Forgiveness. And sometimes when we forgive people, they haven't changed. They haven't done one thing different to make forgiving them easier. I want us to say out loud, 
where we've been rejected, where we've been criticized, where we've been torn down, where we've been betrayed, where there's been broken relationships, even divorce, where there's been deep hurt, even abuse. We're not condoning what was done, but we're saying, Jesus, forgive them. They know not what they did. Are you ready to drop a weight off in the pit of hell called unforgiveness? Come on, let's rally and get rid of it. Someone said to me, well, I'm not crying during all this, and when I forgive someone, don't I have to get super emotional? I said, sometimes. But when Jesus hung on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He made a decision. Are you ready to make a decision? Do you know that unforgiveness can hinder and sometimes end the greatest callings in our lives? How many of us want our callings unhindered? No bitterness, no resentment, the unoffendable heart. We have a culture in the circuit riders called the unoffendable heart in YWAM. Say it with me. I want to have an unoffendable heart. Pray with me. In Jesus' name. I cancel the debt. I totally forgive. Now somebody's going to come to mind. Just say their name out in your heart. I forgive them. Just let it go. Let it go. Let's have a Jesus movement free from the foundation of bitterness and resentment. It's gone. I forgive them. And here's the key. Let's receive forgiveness. I receive forgiveness. Now I want you to get your rumble on because we want to take authority over the root of division and bitterness and anger and get rid of it out of the foundation of a Jesus movement. Would you pray it out loud? In Jesus' name, we're done with bitterness. We're done with unforgiveness. We're done with resentment. As of today, we are free! We are free! We are free! Woo! It's time for a love revolution. The love of Jesus Christ with hearts that are tenderized before God. One more thing. I remember coming to Orlando in the mid-2000s. I went to see Reinhard Bonnke and Daniel Kalinda. They had a thing called Face to Face. And I remember, listen to me, listen to me, this is so important. I walked into their, their meeting, it was like 50 evangelists. I was in the front row and they had a break. And I was so excited because I thought, how many of you ever wanted someone you really thought was a hero to pray for you? And Reinhardt comes over to me and I was part of a move of God in the Northwest and he looks at me and he says, sir, when was the last time you did something preposterous? And I was shook. I was like, what? He said, do you have a church salary? I said, I do. He said, get rid of it. You, sir, are in a faithfulness run. Can you believe it? I went out to the parking lot, and I just turned the parking lot into my travail center until unbelief was out of my life, and I was ready with faith for the impossible things. Soon after that, we had to, our house. We lost everything. We moved to Kona, Hawaii. And that's where the word of the circuit riders and the 200,000 and the 80 million saved came together. Are you ready to finish this section out with just trashing on the spirit of unbelief? It's time for faith, faith for miracles, faith for provision, faith for where you're going, faith for relationships. Pray with me in Jesus' name. I want the preposterous orders, God. Give me the preposterous orders. Choose me, Jesus. I'm done with unbelief. I'm done with cynicism. I believe in the God of the Bible. I don't want to dilute the Bible. You are the God of the Bible. We rebuke unbelief. And we want faith. Let's cry out for faith that God can speak impossible stuff. Let a roar come up. God, give us faith. Give us faith in the name of Jesus. Give us faith, God. 
And when you're ready for God to speak, He needs us all surrendered. How many of us have a clean whiteboard? I believe you do. And you're ready for God to interrupt normalcy with abnormal, comfort with uncomfortability, boredom with wildness, joylessness with joy that you can't even contain. Are you ready for that moment? I want to end this moment because I love this verse. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I believe God's given us, through Todd and Daniel and Teo, and in this moment, so much freedom this morning, this early afternoon, that there is a shout because the Spirit is descending like a dove in this stadium, preparing you for calling and for destiny. It's on, it's happening, it's going down. Let's give God the shout of freedom in this place. Of freedom! We are free! We are free! Thank you, Jesus! Thank you, Jesus!